We are coming to, today's the last Sunday, we're going to be talking about uh, living in Babylon. We're, we're closing that out. Um, matter of fact, I'm, uh, all I had intended to do was the first six chapters of Daniel. When you get to chapter seven, everything changes, but um, I am going to, uh, Rhonda, Rod asked me if I was going to be preaching on the, the last parts. Uh, it has to do with uh, prophecy and the things in the last days. And I said, no, really haven't planned on it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish up 1 Corinthians on Wednesday night, and then I'm going to switch to um, uh, Daniel on Wednesday night. So if you like to know the things that are to come, the two great books in the Bible that speak so much about that, uh, there are plenty of books that talk about the things that are coming, when the king is coming. Again, for his people to call us home, to have this place forever in eternity with him and his home called heaven. But Daniel and Revelation are the bookends. And as a matter of fact, when you get to the end of the book of Daniel, it says that he sealed that book. I believe that that is the book that is opened in Revelation. If you're interested in that, you know where to come on Wednesday nights, and we'll talk about that. It'll be a good time together. But today, we're going to finish up what it means to live in Babylon. Now, I know that we live in the United States of America. I know that we're here in the Bible Belt. We are here in that area of the country where there still are churches all around you. If you're looking for one, then you can find what is called the local church, where you know people, where you see people, where you worship with people, where you pray together, and you can hold each other accountable. You can encourage and lift people up. We can do together, more together, what we can do separately. We can give together. We can work together. We can preach together. We can serve together. We can share the Word of God together. And our community can be blessed by that. There is not a church for the world. There is a church for a body of believers. There is a church that is, has a mission unto the ends of the earth, but it begins in your own Jerusalem. And that's who we are. Now, I understand and know that we live in a, a post-Christian culture. You may not like the, the phraseology of that, but that's the truth. We are living in a culture that doesn't want us to speak. And when we do speak, it's often called hate speech. We are more reluctant, many Christians today, or more reluctant to say the name of Christ and to share their faith than in any time in my lifetime. And I am a student of prophecy, and I do understand that there will be a time of the falling away or of apostasy, and friends, I believe we're in it. There will always be fires of glory for the glory of God. There will always be places where the, the children of God can come together, unite together to serve the Lord with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not being perfect, but seeking to do the best that they can. There will all be the, always be those little firelight places. But I'm telling you, as a whole, we think we're rich and incre increased with goods and have need of nothing, as the book of Revelation says. The mission is misplaced. The passion can be waning. The distractions are everywhere. But folks, good news, Christ is still on the throne. His eyes are looking around to see who he can find that will be a blessing for this world. And I pray that when he looks here, he'll find a people who've fallen in love, who want to make a difference, who want to pour out their life for the glory of God right where he has put you. I'm going to pray now. Then we're going to look at this very familiar story, and we're going to see what God has to say to us today. And I pray as we look at Daniel 6, that we'll not just look at the lion's den, but we'll look at the man of God that had now 80 years of age, taken as a teenager, 
growing up in a, in a non-God-fearing culture, but he stuck to the stuff. And God could trust him. And God could use him. And God was there for him. The same way he wants to be used in our life. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Would you join me? Now, Father, this is your day. We're grateful for it. We come with a happy heart. We come bringing all honor and glory and praise unto you. Jesus, we never want to uh, meet together without saying we love you. And we're thankful for what you did for us. We're thankful for the amazing grace that found us where we were in our sins. Holy Spirit that called us unto the Father. And because we were wooed by you, we yielded ourselves, we repented, we chose you because you first chose us. Now we're yours for those that were wise enough to receive you as Savior and Lord. Names written in the Lamb's book of life. Our eternity's taken care of, but the job's not over. Lord, I don't want there to be one day without praise. Not one day without praise. Not one day without worship. Not one problem that hasn't been bathed in prayer. Not one opportunity that we let slide by. But Lord, awaken your church, the great and mighty, empowered by you, church of the living God, light of the world. Let us take our rightful place in what is quickly becoming a pagan world. And Lord, as we cast our eyes upon you, now we, may we not let them drift to that which doesn't matter. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Because I want to be faithful to Scripture, I'm not going to take and read the whole Scripture. We're just going to look at it together. Is that fair? In verse 1, it said it pleased Darius. Darius is now the leader, not of uh, Babylon. They have fallen. Nebuchadnezzar, his children, they're all gone. It's now the, the, the power of the kingdom of the Medes and the Persians. And Darius has been there to take over this area of Babylon as well as the other areas, and to uh, begin to rule there. And Darius is there, and following, by the way, he didn't know it, but he was following the leadership of the God in Exodus 18 that says you do not do everything by simply the commands of one, but you take that leadership and you spread it out. You'll have some that will be under the one, and then you'll have others to be under them, and others to be under them, and others to be under them. You will take that and divide up those responsibilities. That's the way all good companies, that's the way all good churches, that's the way all good governments should be run. It says he's, he, it pleased him to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom, and over these three governors. So he put these uh, local community leaders but he put governors over them, of whom Daniel was one, that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. So he was transitioning his government, and he wanted some people who could be faithful there to help. In verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps. Now listen to this phrase. Because an excellent spirit was in him. I wonder what that excellent spirit was. It was in him. Was it his spirit? Or was it the one that he served? Is it how good you are? Or how good God is that you serve? Is it your wisdom? Or is it the wisdom and truths of God that you bow to, that you adhere to, and that you follow? There was something set apart in Daniel. This was God's plan. Can you just think about this for a moment? <clears throat> As he allowed the children of Israel, because of their sin, to be taken into captivity, it was God's plan that they be a witness to the world. So when it was Babylon, 
He allowed the teenage boy to find himself in the court of Nebuchadnezzar. And because of how he lived his life, because how he was a steward of what God had given him, because how he wasn't trying to make it all about him, but even in those situations, he was serving the ones that God put him under. And to Nebuchadnezzar, God put all these things together so that Nebuchadnezzar could see God and could praise God. And Nebuchadnezzar, I believe, became a follower of the one true God. Now, Babylon's gone. It's the Medes and the Persians. And they're uh, one that's over them. Darius is there. And all of a sudden, once again, we see this person by how he loved God. Come on. And how he loved others. How he uh, acted before God. And because of that, how he acted in a, in a culture that did not want him, that did not like him, that looked down upon him and literally was racist and hated him because he was a Jew. And yet, and yet, and yet God raised him up like he wants to today. I know so many people want to decry our country and talk about how bad things used to be. And they love to look back when they, they saw a, a better day, when things were different. Folks, we're not going back to that. We're going forward to heaven. And we're not going to ever get to the place where we were. Prophecy tells us that's not going to happen. But we can make a difference in our country, in our community, in our circle of influence. And if there's ever been a time where Christians need to bow and yield and love and serve, come on now, it's today. It's today. God had a plan for them. God has a plan for us. Verse 3, it says, This Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him, a spirit of the living God. So because of envy, in, in verse 4, these others that, that did not, they, they, they didn't like it that Daniel distinguished himself by his service. So they're trying to tear him down. You know, it doesn't matter who you are. If you try to serve God, people aren't going to like it. And they're going to attack you. And they're going to come against you. And they're going to try to tear you down. Because you see, if they're living on this level to tear you down, they've got to get you down on that same level. Don't let them. They're going to come after you, but you need to walk a higher standard, a different way. You need to live like heaven today. So they became to uh, come against him. But it says in verse 4, they could find no charge or fault within him. They found out that if they were going to get Daniel, it was, his life was exemplary. So they had to find something against him and they, they followed him around and they're watching him and they're, they're saying, surely there's something we can find. And what they noticed was Daniel, uh, he was open about his faith toward God and he would go to his house, come on, not to shove it in everybody else's face. He would go to his house, open the doors, point towards Jerusalem and pray. Morning, noon, and night as was his custom, three times a day. So these others that were trying to tear him down, they said, we can't find any fault in his character or his integrity, but we can use his religion against him. So they went to Darius, and, and they lied. Look what it says in verse 7. All the governors, this is what they said to King Darius. King Darius lived forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the ministers, the saint tribes, the counselors, and advisors, have consulted together. That's a lie. They didn't. Daniel wasn't there. To establish a royal statute, make a firm decree that whoever partitions any God or man for 30 days, except you, O Darius, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. And Darius fell into the trap. His ego. Oh, this sounds pretty good. Oh, people are going to pray to me for 30 days. Wow, I kind of like this. And he fell into the trap. He thought all the governors, wasn't Daniel, wasn't Daniel. So they said, write it down, make a decree. Because they knew that when, when, when the leader of the Medes and Persians by law, when they made a decree, it could not be changed. And they knew Darius like Daniel. 
This was their trap. And now Darius has fallen into it, and they think, wow, Daniel will fall into it too. Look what it says in verse 10. Or let me, let me go to verse 9. Verse 9 says, Therefore King Darius signed the written decree. And verse 10, Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with the window open, towards Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed <laughs> and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since his early days. You know what that tells me? That teenage boy that was taken into captivity knew that for him to live the life that would honor, he needed God. And he couldn't take God for granted. He knew that he needed to worship him. And by the way, worship him every day. Three times a day. Now, if you were to ask me, preacher, who were some of the really great saints in the Word of God? The first two that come to my mind are Joseph, not the father, not the one who married Mary, but the, the one who was the child of, of, of Jacob, Joseph. I think of Daniel and I think of Joseph. Because everywhere they went, both were taken into captivity in foreign lands. Both were treated hostile. But it wasn't their circumstances that built their character. It was their God who built their character. And they were men who worshipped. They worshipped. You know the thing that we need more than anything else? is to worship. I, I think if, by the way, God's watching. You know, they, they say that character is what you are when nobody else is watching. Well, God's watching. Now, I know none of you are perfect. That would have been a good time for amen. Right? We're all, none of us are perfect. But we try. And whether... You try hard, or whether you don't try hardly at all, God still loves you. But because God loves you, and because God is good, shouldn't we be people of worship? Now, worship is not religion. Religion's about God. That won't help you. The Pharisees knew about God. And they sang about God. And they made sacrifices because God said made sacrifices. But their heart was far from him. Worship is pointed towards God. So everything that we do is not just a proclamation of what we say about God. It is our heart being poured out to God. When we come together and pray, we're not, I'm not praying when, when I'm asked to pray or when I pray before you. I'm not praying for your ears. I'm praying for his. My heart's not pointed towards you. My heart is pointed towards him. When I sing, I don't want to sing about him. I want to sing to him. Because you see, what I need is my heart needs to be changed. I need to come and worship and worship is coming and pouring yourself out to God. Many people can talk about him and never be moved by him. But if you come to God in prayer, that means pouring out yourself to him, loving him, thanking him, praising him. Oh, what God can do. If when we come to church, if I only talk about him, but it doesn't lead us to him, I have failed. I don't ever get up to preach unless I say, Lord, all is vain unless the Holy Spirit of the Lord comes down. Now there's a unique word, phrase, 
that James, the half-brother of Jesus, said in his epistle, James chapter 4, verse 8, when it says, draw nigh to God, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Now, I, I, I'm, a, I'm a preacher, and I've got all kinds of books in my library that talk about this. And, and they, they, you, if, if there's an area of, of the Word of God I really don't understand, I pray about it, I think about it, I'll, I'll ask others about it, I'll go and I'll, I'll open up a book, and maybe somebody else had wisdom on it that I don't have, and I'll try to learn it. That's what we're all supposed to do, we try to learn. But you know, I have, I have never found anybody that talks about the second half of that phrase. Draw nigh to God, we talk a lot about. But we miss something here. When you draw nigh to God, God is going to draw near to you. Did you hear me? If you're just walking your day, and you've got a busy day, and you're doing all those things, you're, you're, you're saying you're being faithful, but, but if you don't have time in the morning for God, where is your wisdom coming from? Where is your strength coming from? Where is the anointing that you need? Where is it? We have this thing called our conscience. For us Christians, we know who lives within us. The Spirit of the living God lives within us. And the Holy Spirit has sharp elbows. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will come and say, don't do that. Or maybe he'll come and say, you know, it would be great if you did this. And by the way, we hear it, and at that point, we do one of two things. We say yes, or we say maybe later. By the way, that's no. I'll do it when I have a more convenient time. That means no. I don't have time. I'm in a hurry. I got to do this. I got to do that. My schedule won't let me, whatever. We either say when the Holy Spirit comes and, and puts this beautiful wrapped present in front of us, we either say, oh, yes, thank you, Lord, or we say no. Now, when you draw near to God in obedience, when your heart in worship becomes one with Him, not only will you be moving towards God, God's moving towards you. I've always said this. I, I, can't, I can't give you a, a, a chapter and verse that describes this any better than James 4, 8. But, but I, I believe if you take one step for him, he'll take 100 for you. How many of you know that he can move heaven and earth for you? How many of you know that he would give his life's blood for you? How many of you know that he desires best for you? That's the God that we serve. How amazing that is. That's the God that we serve. So when you say yes to him, he's coming. His power, his love, his mercy, it's coming. You ignore him. And you all know exactly what I'm talking about because I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it. And God's just standing there like he's knocking at the door and we're just going to leave him knocking. But if we need him, we'll call and we expect him to run. But I believe you're as close to God as you want to be. That's a powerful phrase. And obedience, if you're drawing near to him, he's going to draw near to you. But if you're walking casually away, he's going to do the very same. When my children were young, I tried to teach them lessons. And I'd say, this is what you need to do. Sometimes they knew better than old dad, and they wouldn't do it. So you know what I'd do? I'd let them go on. I mean, there's a different ways of doing discipline, right? But one of the ways you do discipline is you just let them get, you let them reap what they sow. Does that sound scriptural? And maybe they'll fall down and go, ow. And cry a little bit. But maybe they'll learn a lesson. Y'all hear me? Now I'm there and watching. 
but I will allow. The Holy Spirit comes to woo. And I'm, I'm here to tell you, if in our life we live a life of worship, drawing nigh to God, worshiping Him, pointed to Him, pointed in service, pointed in love, pointed in prayer, making time, that He's going to be there. He, he lives for this, and He wants us to live for Him. So what did Daniel do when he was faced with this crisis? He knew, <laughs> he knew it was a death sentence. And how did they know? Because they had followed him and watched him. It amazes me that, that they, they, they saw him praying and heard him praying. They knew what he was doing. With the anointing of God, it never changed them. I used to have a preacher friend. His name's Clack Stubbs. Uh, Clack, in my very first church, was about three miles from Clack's church. And uh, Clack, was a, he's a great big guy and got that deep voice and all that. And uh, we were supposed to get together one day, and we got together quite a bit back in the end. But, but uh, he took pity in this young preacher, and, and I went over to his church. And, and, and back in their education wing where they, his office was, uh, the secretary's office was there, and I, I walked in. And when I walked in the door, this big, booming voice was filling up that education room. Every day, he would go to the church. He would be the first one there. He would go to his office. He would close the door, and he would pray, and you could hear him everywhere. Now, he didn't start that way. He'd start praying like you and I pray. Father, thank you for this and all that. Or for Clack, it was more like, Father, thank you for this and all that. But then it, it, he'd get cranking up. Come on. And as the Holy Spirit would come in its anointing, he'd kind of loosen up the joints a little bit. That voice would get to building up a little bit. There would be a little bit of a power and the anointing of God would get there. And the next thing you know, he's shouting and he's singing and he's doing everything. Now, it's not simply because he's supposed to, but there's something inside of him that wants to. The power of God was in that place. And when Daniel prayed, he didn't care who heard. The power of God was there. So they saw old Daniel praying and ran back to Darius and said, Oh, Darius, live forever. You remember that decree? <laughs> Nobody's supposed to pray to anybody but you. Yes, I remember it. Well, let, let, me, let me read this verse to you. Verse 13, so they answered and said before the king, that Daniel, boy, that sounds good, doesn't it? Who was one of the captives from Judah. Can you hear the racism there? He does not show due regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but, made this, but makes his petition three times a day. Verse 14, Darius is, was greatly displeased. He spent all day uh, trying to find a way out. By the end of the day, the decree had been set and, and nothing had been done to Daniel. So they come back to him and they reminded, oh, Darius, you can't change the law. You, you wrote it out. You made a decree. Verse 16, so the king gave the command and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke saying to Daniel, your God, your God, whom you serve, I love this now, continually, he will deliver you. Not because Darius believed in the God, but Darius had seen it in his life and had seen the power of God in Daniel's life. And because of his witness, because of his testimony, Darius has been pricked in his heart. Daniel didn't have to preach the message. His life preached the message. Well, verse 17, they sent, went down there. They put the stone over it. He sealed it. And that old Darius, he, didn't, he went home and he fasted that night. He's troubled. He's tricked. He says, my ego, my pride has got me into this place. And Daniel's going to pray for it. He prays and he prays and he prays and he prays. As soon as it was, first thing in the morning, he's down there and he's running. He says he came in verse 20. He came to the den. He cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to him, Daniel, I love this now, servant 
of the living God. Your God is alive and well. Has your God, whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? In some of the sweetest words that Darius ever heard in his life, verse 21, O king, live forever. Respect, kindness. When evil had come upon him, all Daniel could do was share the love. I wonder, you know, there's plenty of pictures that show uh, Daniel in the lion's den. And, and I don't know how accurately they, they portray what happened there. But Daniel says what happened. He says in verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that there were have, have not hurt me because I also found innocence before him. And also, O king, I have done, done no wrong before you. <laughs> Daniel didn't go fretting. Daniel didn't go worrying. Daniel went worshiping. And I don't know if Daniel saw the angel or not. That's not important. The angel was sent by God. The word means messenger or envoy. God said, you're not touching my man. And God sent the... Now, the, the angel could have said to those lines, sit down. Hush. Go sleep. Or the angel could have grabbed him by the mouth and said, you're not doing it. What does not matter is the reaction of the enemy. What matters is the angel of God stood it for, before him. How many of y'all believe in angels? Amen. How many of you know that they do the will of God? How many of you know that God is willing to go to any length to protect the one who's standing for him? Amen. Now, if you know that, and if you worship the God who has promised that he would be with you, he would never leave you, he would never forsake you, that all power of heaven is in him, that when you are obedient to the spirit, to the nudge, to the obedience of God, he will move heaven and earth for your benefit. Why do we fear what the world has to say when we've already been in the presence of heaven? Because our eyes are on the world and our eyes aren't in worship of heaven. You know why church is important? Because people won't know this, the things of God, until they come and see it and experience it. Darius would not have known had he not gone and seen it and experienced it and then his life was changed. Church. That is the thrill of the blessings of God for us. This Christmas season, more people are going to be talking about Jesus than any other time of the year, including Resurrection Sunday. They're going to be talking about it, and they may not even know everything that there is to know about it. But I'm here to tell you, if we can live the life, can speak lovingly, be kind, Obey the Spirit of God if we, in the next 21 days, can live in worship of God. I wonder what a difference God can make in us, in our center of influence, at our work, at our school. Well, Darius said, come on, get him out of there. By the way, where's those other guys that brought this whole thing up? Get them. By the way, bring their whole family. Now, you might not like that, but I'm here to tell you that's what old Darius did. And old Daniel comes out. I believe he probably came out and yawned real big and said, I had a good night's sleep. I don't know. Because you can, when, you're, when you're walking with God, you don't have to worry with God. You can just rest with God. And those that wanted to bring Daniel down, they went down in the lion's den. And by the way, they didn't even hit the bottom before the lions were tearing them 
up, broke every bone in their body. And Darius is proclaiming, listen to this in verse 25, to all peoples, nations, languages that dwell on all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree, a new decree, that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. Now they don't need to do it out of compulsion, but he didn't know any better. Can you hear that he's trying to say, this is real and this is right and we're going to do it? He says, for he is the living God, steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues, church. He delivers and rescues in our day. He is willing to deliver us and rescue us. It sounds like the cross, don't it? And he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. Oh, that we can be the living testimony. Oh, that we can have a desire. Not because Preacher Brian told you or because we read it in here, but what would it be like if morning, noon, and night we took time out of our day to worship, to point our hearts to heaven, to give Him praise and glory, and also to confess and repent. To have a song, as Mark had said, to have a song. May a song of praise, of worship to Him. Maybe we could sing, God has made a way where there seemed to be no way. He works in ways that we cannot see, and He'll make a way for me. He'll be my guide and hold me closely to His side. I give you great praise for you, Lord, for that. He works in ways we cannot see. He will make a way for me. Maybe we would be better if we just had a good old prayer meeting in our lives, not just for an hour on Sunday. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Listen to the drawing and the nudge. And if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, you're on your own. You need an advocate. You need one who holds the, the beings of heaven and the beings of earth in his hand and can take care of you no matter what.